Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We're recording today from the Millennium Library in Winnipeg, which is within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Inunu, and Dakota peoples, and in the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Hijab Butch Blues by Lamia H. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, and I'm tempted to name my bed the belly of the whale and hide there for a few days. <laughs> Across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor from the Louis Rail Library, and I cannot wait to find out what Toby and Dennis's favorite prophets are. I'm Toby, I'm an outreach librarian based out of here at Millennium Library, and my favorite prophet is John Connor. Nice. Dennis? I don't have a favorite prophet. Oh, okay. Hmm. I've never thought about it before. A good book can carry me away from an ever engine on an And you, dear readers, we wouldn't do this without you. We'd love to hear from you, whether it's in essay form or maybe something a little shorter. You can find our email address and all our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. Hang around till the end of the episode to enjoy our favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. Before we do in, let's do a quick check-in with the panel. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing We're okay. all eagerly anticipating Trevor's sad story. Yeah, I have a bit of sad news. <laughs> uh, I found out that uh, Winnipeg uh, legend Ray St. Germain passed away yesterday. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, you know, I recall, Dennis, you had uh, a story about him getting a library card. Not a library card, oh. but I was working at the circulation desk at Henderson Library late 80s or early 90s. Early 90s. I scanned the card, and the name Raymond St. Germain came up, and I took a look up quickly, and it was Ray St. Germain standing in front of me borrowing a book. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, because he, he was uh, well-known and well-loved as a singer, a songwriter, mostly in the country music, but he got his kind of early start in rock and rockabilly style. And and my kind of personal story is that, and again, I couldn't find anything about this in his official biography, but uh, in St. James, he, for a while there, sold cars at a car dealership, and my friend's family bought their car from Ray St. Germain. Hmm. He wrote an autobiography called, I Wanted to Be Elvis, So What Was I Doing in a Moose Jaw? <laughs> and I was delighted to find out that we do have a copy of it in the local history room. It might be worth the trip down to the Millennium Library to uh, page through. So rest in peace, Ray St. Germain, a piece of local talent who will be dearly missed by at least two of the three panelists uh, here. Yeah. And maybe maybe dearly missed is maybe overstating it. Well, I mean, you know. I didn't know him personally. I didn't know I him personally either. Him. Yeah. I didn't know him at all. But, no. But I knew by reputation. He used to have a show on TV, the Ray St. Germain Hour. He, t- something oh, he, like had, that? he had so many shows. The Road Show, the May T Hour. He had shows on the CBC, something, something called Time for Living series that he hosted. Uh, and the Ray St. Germain Show, exactly. And he even went overseas. He entertained the troops. He won a talent contest called Talent Caravan at age 18. I could go on. Yeah. A long, long career. Yeah. Mostly and, local. Yeah. You know, in the 80s, any night of the week, you could probably find him playing at a local hotel lounge. I never did, though, because I was too young. As was I. All our best wishes to the Ray St. Germain family and fans. And fun fact, I think his granddaughter is also a musician, and she is uh, starting her career. So the St. Germain name will live on. So let's get to the book. Uh, Toby's going to tell us about the author, after which Trevor will give us a summary. Lamia H. is anonymous, so there's not a lot of biographical information out there about her. But this book is a memoir, so we can assume certain things to be true about her. Um, We know she was born somewhere in South Asia, perhaps Pakistan, as she speaks Urdu, which is the national language of Pakistan, and that she moved to a rich Arab country, I'm kind of assuming somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula, where she attended an international school. We know she has a brother. She moved to the U.S., likely the eastern part for college. She attended graduate school in New York, and she's a Capricorn. So that's what I've pulled out from the book. From trying to find more information about her on the internet, I've learned that she does have a child. And that's approximately two at this point. And then the rest of the information I have about her is just from her bio on our website. 
So she is a queer Muslim writer and organizer living in New York City. Um, her work has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Salon, Vice, Autostraddle, and Vox. She's received fellowships from the Lambda Literary, Aspen Words, and, and Queer Arts. Um, Hijab Butch Blues was published in 2023 and won the Stonewall Book Award, the Brooklyn Public Library Book Award, and the Israel Fishman Nonfiction Award, and it was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Her organizing work centers around creating spaces for LGBTQ plus Muslims, fighting Islamophobia, and abolishing prisons. In her free time, she eats a lot of desserts, baked by her partner, plays board games, and works on her goal of traveling to every subway stop in the city. And she has never run a marathon. So there you go. That's great. Yeah. Well, it, like Toby said, uh, with the author writing anonymously, it was a little hard to gather up biographical details. And the same way, it's kind of hard to do a summary of a memoir, which is stories that a person has recollections of their life. So what I did instead, if, you, if you'll allow me, is in the edition of the book that I had, which was an e-book, there was uh, a note to the reader at the end that I, thought I would just read because I, I thought this would be interesting. Now, dear reader, Hijab Butch Blues is a memoir in which I reconceive stories from the Quran as queer brown immigrant narratives in order to better understand my own queer brown immigrant life. I wrote this book for myself. The self I was in my early teens when I was figuring out my sexuality and didn't have any queer brown models to turn to for guidance. I turned instead to the Quran and the rich stories and complicated characters it contained, seeking validation of my anger, queerness, and gender nonconformity. These stories helped me feel less alone. I wrote this book for the self I was in my early 20s when I moved to a new city and realized that this was a chance to start over, to invent myself anew, to live an authentic queer life. That life didn't adhere to mainstream traditional ideas of how an out gay person should live, but it was true to me and who I was, and that felt both thrilling and terrifying. I wrote this book for the self I am now, in my 30s, building a family and community of my own, I am healing from the racism, homophobia, transphobia, and Islamophobia I experienced and sometimes internalized. This book is a record of how I'm unlearning these things. It is one of the ways I'm fighting for a better world. Since I was a teen studying in Quran class, I've always read to solve my problems. The stories of my people, our traditions, and our sacred heroes offer examples of how to live. I identify with them the situations in which they find themselves, and the way their faith guided them when they felt lost or afraid. In my adult life, whenever I encounter a problem, a thought that gets stuck in my head, a feeling that won't go away, I write. I write to tease apart the strands of the issue, to organize my confusion, to make sense of my experiences. In Hijab Butch Blues, I marry these two problem-solving techniques, reading and writing, to make new meaning of my experiences, to identify more loving ways of living, to practice letting go of coping mechanisms that were no longer serving me, to realize that I was not and never have been alone, and to deepen my faith in humanity, my devotion, and myself. While I hope that queer Muslim people will see themselves in my story, this book is for anyone who's ever sought to build a life for themselves without a model, without a map. At its core, my story is about the ways we explore who we are, trying to find our way in a world that may not always value our experience. Hijab Butch Blues is, simply put, for anyone who seeks to be thoughtful about how they live. I hope that you'll come away from this book feeling less alone in your differences. I hope that my story helps you see that we can turn toward our differences instead of away from them, that our differences can actually help us to build community, love more deeply, and live in a way that feels true. I hope that on these pages you will see and come to love how messy faith can be, and how that messiness makes space for us to grapple with the contradictions that make us human. Messiness is, at its best, generative. It allows us to ask ourselves the truest, most important questions about what it means to be alive. Thank you for reading. Lamia H. So I kind of thought that kind of summarizes up uh, her intent with the book. So, Or did you just get lazy this month? Well, at least I didn't use chat GPT <laughs> like I did last month for the summary. <laughs> Which I didn't reveal on air, but now I am. I felt guilty about it all month because it was such a kind of a generic. Uh, but this, I, I, I guarantee, and maybe Lana used Chat GPT. I don't think so, though. It sounds like uh, your voice. I think next month we're going to see if we can do Chat GPT in a voice synthesizer and just replace Trevor entirely <laughs> and see how it goes. Well, Trevor's not around for next episode, so so it'll be a perfect opportunity. Perfect. Well, if you hear Trevor next month on the show, <laughs> that's what we did. I'm sure that version will be less verbose. 
Yeah. Uh, so before we dive into the book, I think it's fair for us to acknowledge that I'm a middle-aged, white, cisgender, heterosexual atheist. And I am a, I'm going to see all the things that I am. They're similar. I am also a uh, white male, middle-aged, cisgendered Christian. And across the table for me is. <laughs> I'm an elder millennial. True. I don't. I've, I guess I'm not middle-aged. I don't know. I'm a female. I'm cisgender. I am a cultural Jew. Am I missing anything? And so we're going to be talking about a woman of color, an immigrant, a Muslim, a queer person. So we're, you know, just acknowledging we're coming from different backgrounds and talking about it, but we're going to do our best to talk about it well anyway. Uh, so how do you guys find it? I liked it. I wouldn't shout it from the rooftops. I wouldn't sort of recommend it highly. There's very specific people I would recommend it for. But it is, it's unlike anything I've ever read. It opened my eyes to a lot of things. It taught me a lot about Islam. It made me think very differently about what it means to be queer. So, I mean, I'm glad I'm, I read it. I think it's a valuable read in terms of expanding my awareness to experiences that are very different from my own. It's interesting because I had a, a different response to it where mm -hmm. I was expecting it to be very specific and not have anything to say to me. I, I found it super interesting and that the things that she's talking about in the book, I felt could apply to really just anybody that wanted to you know, be thoughtful about how they live and how they think about their, their selves and their identity and what they believe and who they love. I really liked the way that she was an unapologetic uh, Koran nerd and that she, from, from the earliest days she can remember, she would, you know, listen to the stories of the Koran and, and know the stories of these prophets and Muhammad and uh, never kind of questioned that part of her, her faith necessarily, that it was questioning who she was in relation to that, her faith that was uh, one of the bigger challenges, especially when she was younger. I really loved how she kind of grouped the book according to different characters if you, uh, and chapters in the Quran and how she kind of interpreted their stories, sometimes very radically from what I'm sure they had uh, originally been interpreted, but that she was able to glean meaning from these stories for herself in her life today, you know, to me, it showed that in her mind, you know, God was speaking to her through these stories and that, it, and that these stories were like a living uh, thing. They, these weren't some old dusty stories without any uh, relevance. She, she found the relevance in them. And we can talk later about some of the parallels she made. But that was sort of my take. So off the top, uh, this is not a book I ever would have picked up on my own just based on the title because the title didn't entirely make sense to me, although I discovered another title that's out there that probably explains the source of it. But it's just, I don't normally read memoirs or biographies. I don't normally read as much religious stuff as I used to when I was younger. So it's just not something that would normally tempt me to read it. But I really enjoyed it. Lamia H. has a very interesting mind, and I love the way that she presented it. Uh, I love the way that she thinks about things and really digs in uh, in a way that uh, I haven't seen articulated so well previously. I love the through stories, the threads that she drew, the connections she had from different stages of her life and how she would integrate it into her uh, religious beliefs, into her study of the Quran and the way she connected with other people. I walked away from it thinking that she was a neat person that I would like to hang out with, If uh, not that we're likely to run into each other. Uh, but, you know, seems like a person that I would enjoy talking to. I just, I love that kind of mind. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it on that front. Who'd have thunk that you two would enjoy this book more than I would? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. You're normally the more literary. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and here you are, like, <laughs> 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 I, I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> yeah. I was also interested, like as a person who grew up in a Christian family and went to a religious school, so I've read huge chunks of the Bible and uh, very familiar with a lot of the stories. And in hearing the Muslim take on those stories, which are familiar to me in one context, and then they're similar, you know, of course, the names are a little different, um, and they, the stories are a little different, but they're very close, and it was interesting to kind of hear those described. 
I had no idea this. there were stories in the Quran that were the same stories as those in the Bible. Like that there's, you know, the Noah and Moses and the Jonas mm. or Jonah. Like I, I, that blew my mind. Well, I was, I was aware of that concept, but I'd been told it by like, uh, pastors and such and uh you know in retrospect i put less weight on what they what they told me about uh islam because it tends to be a little biased for obvious reasons so i've never actually read the quran and i have never read the stories as portrayed in the quran but i'll take what she's saying as uh being reasonably accurate you and know? i mean she's she's paraphrasing too you know she's yeah not, yeah. yeah she's she's making the language easy to go with but uh and here's the other thing I really appreciated about this book. A lot of times when I have read books by people with a very strong religious bent who are talking about stuff that includes their religious life, there's often an element of proselytizing in there. Mm-hmm. And I did not feel that even a little bit from this. But what I did get from it is her joy in the way she lived that part of her life, the way she really got excited about reading these surahs and uh, passages and discussing them. You know, I have interesting discussions with friends that are intelligent and it's like, you know, you have good discussions and she would just have those same things. But she's nerding out about the Quran Mm -hmm. and uh, getting excited about uh, ways that that refers to her life. Uh, So I really like to see that kind of expression. You know, I don't know. It's very positive and uplifting without also feeling like someone's trying to convince you that you got to do things the same way that they do. I did find it sad, though, that she has to hide this key part of her identity from the people she loves the most. Yeah, with all the stories with the family. and Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, like, I am curious that now that she has a child, how that has, how that has played out. But mm. yeah, that, that made me sad. Yeah, and, and there were certain points of the book where you almost got the sense, okay, she is going to you know, tell her family, but then she kind of changes her mind. Or uh, I love the different stories of how, like the different stages of her coming out mm-hmm. and uh, and how she kind of phrased it, not so much as coming out, but as inviting in. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really interesting, like, uh, subversion of the, of the idea that instead of coming out to the world, you are inviting people that uh, you care about and are close to you into your life, into who you are, and you're expanding your circle a little bit. And I just thought that was kind of a, I've never heard it put that way before. But uh, yeah, like, I mean, uh, like we're saying, like, what, what would I have relatable to a, uh, a queer uh, Muslim woman immigrant? And yet the stories, like when she came out to her friend Kara and uh, and all the nervousness and all that like, i was right there on that balcony with her like, i could it's so relatable or or that funny story about her friend billy where he wanted her to come out to his family because they were bugging <laughs> him that they were a couple and like this is driving me crazy and and so she had these practice runs um i thought the my favorite or maybe not favorite but my the most uh lasting chapter for me was the one about Aisha, uh, Aisha who was the um, the wife of the pharaoh, and the pharaoh was super terrible, abusive. And it was the one story that Lamia's mom and aunties would always turn to to justify why you would stay in abusive relationships. And that, you know, well, I, I can't, I'm probably not saying it right, Asaya, you know, put up with all this, and that shows that she's she's devout, you know, and so, and of course, uh, that chapter was really hard to read because she sees all of these uh, people, her friends and her cousins, and uh, in these awful relationships, and mm-hmm. being told that they have to stay, and and how she sees herself in a different way, like it was in her relationship with the states, and how it was kind of an abusive relationship with the immigration, and she was tying it all. And I love the parallels she drew, so that that chapter stuck with me. Yeah, that was a particularly difficult chapter because that's one of those things where Islam is traditionally practiced, per my understanding, isn't especially friendly to homosexuality. There, like, there, there's lots of conservative religious beliefs that emphasize how important it is to stay in a marriage no matter what. And that story, like Asaya's story, is like one of those where it seems to be saying, yeah, stick around and put up with it. And that's a really hard message to take from someone who is a feminist, uh, who, you know, can see the awful, can see the evil in that type of a relationship and in staying in that type of relationship. And, but she's devout and it's important for her to be able to reconcile this somehow. Mm -hmm. And that whole uh, chapter was, yeah, this, this struggle with how do you, how do you square that? Yeah. 
that she she manages to and i mean one of one of the things she does very close readings of the quran you know she's really looking at textual minutia and like i have an english degree i i'm used to these sorts of things but like Sometimes it feels like a bit of a stretch, you know, like just because Miriam says she's never been touched by a man, does that mean she's gay? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, you can read Moby Dick as a queer story or like Sense and Sensibility is as, you know, about fishing. Like if you are motivated enough, you can really find whatever you want in these in these stories. And I mean, I'm happy for her. I'm happy that she she could spin these in ways that made sense to her and made her feel better about being queer. But a lot of it just felt like felt like a bit of a stretch. Well, personally, yeah. as an atheist, I tend to think that all religious beliefs are a bit of a stretch. Um, but also like I've read different things over the years that have made me uh, a little more open to the way people do that. Uh, for instance, like tarot cards, mm. which to me are nonsense in terms of being able to like predict your past and future. But I was reading a forum when they were discussing tarot cards and someone said, you know, uh, not all of us who use tarot cards believe that they're magic or spiritual or anything like that. Uh, and and it is a, a type of randomization. And then you you have a random assortment of cards in front of you and then you start working through your problems and apply them through the imagery in the cards. And it just gives you another way to yeah, reframe things to, yeah. to modify because you're stuck in a certain thought pattern and randomizing it uh, makes you break out of certain patterns that you're naturally in for someone like Lamia or uh, anyone who like does this type of deep dive into something that they find authoritative or inspirational uh, I think it's the same kind of thing. It's a way of reframing things that you're stuck on. And uh, because the Quran is particularly important to her, it gives it an additional weight that lets her take it to heart. I don't know. That's well, and the way I see it, too, is that there, there are so many ways that you can interpret these stories. And, and so often it isn't so much the story, but what the person who is hearing it or reading it is bringing to the story. And if you believe in the idea of, of a God, then of like the idea of, of God speaking through the stories, then, you know, she is getting this little kernel of truth at this time when she's thinking of the story. And then a year later, there might be another little aspect of that story that speaks to her in a different way. Like I was thinking like the story of Noah that she talks about. And she ties that into like his frustration with trying to like, uh, you know, con convert uh, the world and the world was full of uh, unbelievers and he just got so frustrated with it. Then, then of course God tells him to build an ark, which totally kind of just resets things. And so she was kind of the moral of that story she got was that sometimes you just need to destroy your cycles that you're stuck in, you know, wipe the slate clean and start fresh. And she was tied into her, a series of non dates or mm -hmm. she was in the cycle of like, not, you know, non date number one, which she get kept going out with straight women. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and then finally she realized, so I, I yeah, I, I totally get what you're, what you're saying, Toby, that it, some of these are a stretch and, and some of them are a stretch, but I think that's, what's kind of cool about it that, uh, I would love to get, have a whole book that would just be Lamia H's guide to the Quran, where she just like, like I would read that, like, because I was trying to read a little bit more, like, like you guys, I haven't read the Quran. I don't know really a whole lot about Islam. So I was trying to do a little research uh, before this episode, but like the books I found, one was like, yeah, yeah, Islam for the Western mind. It was written by like this American Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. Like, what does a Presbyterian know about uh, Islam? Like, I was reading this. I'm like, ah, no, I'm like, I, I don't want this interpretation. This is wrong. But but reading this, I felt it was genuine. Like, I felt like she was like what we were reading was somebody who who believes in this and is able to sort of share a a really unique take on it. Uh, and so I, I enjoyed all of the all of the parallels she drew. Yeah, although I will suspect that uh, many of the things that she draws from it would be uh, non-standard. Oh, yeah. for sure. Have you looked I, at the Goodreads reviews of this book? 
I had I did not. No. Yeah, I mean, like all Goodreads reviews, you know, some are like, oh, this book is amazing, and some are like, oh, this book is okay. Um, but then there's quite a few one star reviews where they're like, this book is blasphemous. How sure. dare you say that Allah is non binary? How dare you call Maryam a dyke? Like, like just people very angry. Very, yeah, very yeah. angry. Yeah. For sure, this would be considered like reform Islam. Like, this would, <laughs> oh, yeah. this would not be like a fundamentalist, you know? Uh, absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in any religious group, there is a range of opinions and beliefs within it, but some are definitely less standard than others and would evoke more ire from traditional adherents. But definitely a feminist queer perspective on Islam is less common. Yeah. Um, and like reading, reading this book, I was like, well, you know, maybe she can come out to her family. Like maybe they would understand, maybe they could work this through. And then reading those reviews, I was like, yeah, I, I, I get it. You know, it's, it depends so much on your family. Yeah. I did listen to a podcast interview with her and she said she came out to her brother and it went well. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. I remember coming out to my parents as an atheist and my parents were very devout and it was a very difficult conversation, but they continued to love me the same as they always had. Yeah. And like that, I feel like that should be a universal thing that parents do, you know, like we love you regardless of who you are. And yeah, but I've read many stories about people who came out to their parents uh, to say that they weren't religious and then being kicked out of the house, being, uh, you know, not invited to family functions anymore. You risk a lot. And, And Lamia is one of those people who seems very, she's very social. And very tied into her family. Her family is very important to her. So risking that, you know, it can be a really tough thing to do. So she I don't blame her. Was, well, she was yeah. super stressed out about uh, faking a, a cold to skip out on the <laughs> oh, IED yeah. so she could uh, <laughs> hang out with her pal. So I could see, you know, she seems like she's, she, like, she's a, like genuinely a, a good person, I think, who uh, mm-hmm. that sort of sense of rejection uh, would be devastating to her. Uh, it re- reminded me a little bit of the was it the um, the Joseph story where she talked about how she related to Joseph because he made himself indispensable to the Pharaoh by mm-hmm. being in charge of the granaries and how she saw that as being like uh, queer indispensability, which I never heard of that term before. But the idea that um, I think she made it up. Oh, did she make it up? I okay, so. that's why I had, yeah. No, no, I think she had oh, read she, something about oh, she it. Did? Yeah. Oh, okay. About yeah. uh, you know how you know queer people go out of their way to make sure that they're useful and helpful and a part of people's lives, so that it makes it harder for people to cut them out of their lives because the, you know they're it's found family and not actual family, but kind of a sad idea. But uh, yeah, towards the end of the book, she had also. Like when she brought her girlfriend to meet her family, but just as her friend mm. and the way it was all framed as this is what I do because I love my family. You know, this is the sacrifice I make for my family so that they can feel comfortable and I can still be part of their lives. And, you know, uh, which ooh, that was a little heartbreaking because, <laughs> like you said, this mm-hmm. is a big, important part of her. Yeah. And I mean, I guess she talks a lot, too, about, you know, the authentically gay experience. And part of that is like coming out and either your family accepts you and everyone is happy or your family rejects you and you have a sob story. And she wasn't willing to have that sob story. Yeah. 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 And basically she was saying, you know, this is the way I want to do it. I don't want to do that particular thing. Although now that she has a kid, like, I don't know how she's how she's going to keep that a secret. The like from oh her, from right her yeah because where's the father where's the father oh. who are you raising this child with you know if you mm. don't have a male partner like where's the baby daddy how is this child oh, conceived yeah yeah it's man that, that's a real wrinkle i didn't think of that at first when you had mentioned that she had a child but it's like oh yeah yeah so lamia h if you're listening we need a uh, follow-up book <laughs> yes to update us on your life because we found it interesting up till now and we know more well, now we're invested in lamia yeah. yeah she's made herself indispensable to us. <laughs> <laughs> no it was a very thoughtful book all around and again that's part of what really what i really enjoyed is she's a very thoughtful person going a lot of perspectives around any particular issue like that one line when she talked about is she and her friend would watch the World Cup and choose teams based on their anti-colonialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It doesn't leave you many options. <laughs> no, no. 
Well, I think that basically means you cheer for the team, uh, for the countries that had been colonized and were now, mm. you know, free from it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I assume so. It means they're not cheering for, you know, Europe or, uh, okay. yeah, right. <laughs> or North America. <laughs> yeah. It'd probably be cheering for mainly the African countries, mm-hmm. South America. I don't know. <laughs> As well, I mean, when I'm watching a sports tournament, I'm not invested in any particular team. I like to pick the underdogs when I can, you know, yep. or a team name that seems cool, or the team that has the best uniforms. Oh yeah, the best colors. What did you two think of all the terminology in this book? All the the Arabic or the the Muslim or Islam terms. Did you find yourself usually, distracted? Did you look them up? Usually, did you... thing, usually those types of things really like sidetrack me. <laughs> Down rabbit holes. I, I I don't think I it bothered me this time. It didn't, I don't think it kind of took me out of the narrative. Having said that, though, my nerd word may be an Arabic word. Uh-huh. <laughs> I guess it's maybe a fifty fifty thing where I dive into the other language or I don't. But uh, I didn't in this case. Uh, most of them I think made sense in context more or less. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't feel a need to look them up. How about yourself? Yeah, similar. I mean, I find it interesting that. They weren't italicized. They weren't necessarily always in a context in which you could immediately understand it. But some of them I started to understand as I uh, as I continued reading. I did like I did start a tally list of words, and then I just I didn't look them up because it didn't matter anymore mm. at that point. But you know, you were talking about Lamia being unapologetically a Quran nerd, and I think this book is unapologetically Muslim. You mm. know, she just. She she doesn't give you contact. She doesn't italicize them. They are what they are. And yeah, yeah. like you said in that letter I read, she wrote it for herself. Right. You know, yeah. And so yeah, yeah. But such clear writing. You two really liked this book, huh? I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah. yeah. Same. Like I, I thought I had something to talk about, but maybe I wouldn't really really love it. But I, I, I yeah, I, I I enjoyed it. I think my opinion is I think it's that someone who is willing to go in with open mind reading this book would get many valuable things out of it. Yeah. And my thing is just, I am fortunate to know a lot of people with what I think of as interesting minds and uh, they tend to be outsiders in one way or another. And I'm just drawn to that. I'm drawn to the thoughtful outsider who just thinks different and can express it in a way that draws me in. And uh, she's one of those. Mm-hmm. You know, just the type of person that I like. Yeah, she feels like a, like a trailblazer in the sense that she has a very like strong, almost like moral compass, and that she she knows what she wants, but she doesn't know where to find it necessarily. And this is her journey, and she finds her people eventually, which is kind of <laughs> that's nice. the other thing. You, you know, know, we we often have talked in the past about the the concept Erica brought up years ago with the the found family, and just how appealing that is to find people that get you and that you feel good with. Like, I love that last story where, where she and her friends are all on that camping trip. And mm-hmm. then she's at, well, again, asking them what their favorite prophet was. And, <laughs> and then some of them roll her eyes like, Oh, here she goes again. And, you know, and they start making fun of her and they, they can, they can kind of like give her the gears cause they're friends. And, you know, and I just thought that was just a really, really awesome little circle of friends they have. You know, mm-hmm. I thought I really loved that dynamic of them going out, out West to the, wherever they were, the Rockies or something. And, you know, just having these discussions about prophets on their on the hike. Who's your favorite prophet, Trevor? Oh gosh, I was too busy wondering what yours guys <laughs> were. I, I'll, I will say, out of this story, I think my my favorite one was Jonah, and yeah. the way that Lamia took the story about how sometimes you just have to like pick your battles, and that uh, the line about leaving is not the same as giving up. You know, and then you know, while Jonah was seeing somebody that was going away and and not doing what God uh, asked them, she saw it, or not? No, she hated Jonah for that, but it was her friend that had her come around to saying that no, you know, he's sensible. You know, you, you got to protect yourself, and you have to, uh, you can't, you know, go after everything, and you have to pace yourself. And the idea that the whale is a safe space that yeah. that is uh, that's a spot where. You know, you can you can recharge and you, and you can rejuvenate. And uh, so, yeah, I think Jonah out of the ones that were mentioned in the book. I think that was my favorite of the interpretations in there, too, because hmm. that's definitely not how that story is normally preached when mm-hmm. you're in church. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's 
<laughs> it's certainly not a preach that Jonah's going around uh, spreading Islam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not not in the church I grew up in. No, no. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I really like that take on it. And that was, I think, some of my mo- the most fun parts of reading the book, where her and her friends were nitpicking at the story to find things that aren't necessarily obvious. Because a lot of stories in the Quran, the Bible, uh, the Torah, they don't have that much in the way of details. You mm-hmm. know, they have broad strokes. And they're traditionally taken to be a certain way, and tradition is very important in the way a lot of these things are communicated. But, you know, if you're going by the text and then informing it with tradition and then being open to it not just being the way it was traditionally described, there's a lot of room in there to move. I thought it was interesting the way that uh, she did that consistently in ways that made sense to her mentally and, and spiritually. But that was my favorite example of that. Hmm. Like, you just, no, no, look at that entirely different. And suddenly you see a different kind of value there that you can apply to your life. And I'm big on the idea that you need recovery time and recovery space, you know. Even if it isn't a whale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, granted, I don't actually want to be inside a whale. It doesn't seem to be that comfortable. All of a sudden, I have the words to love shack going through my head. <laughs> I got me a Chrysler. It's as big as a whale. Yeah. But again, if I can name my bed the belly of the whale, then I will <laughs> gladly stay there for three days. Do we have more we want to say about this book, or do we think we've said what we need to say? Recommend? Yes, I would definitely recommend this book, without even telling somebody what it's about. i say, you should read this. I yeah. think the title gives gives it away. <laughs> it gives some of it away. <laughs> Did you know uh, what she wanted to call it originally? Was, uh, uh, yeah. Marianne was a dyke. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not sure why she didn't. Did someone talk her out of it? Or well, there's um, there's a famous book called Stone Butch Blues, okay, right. by Leslie Feinberg, which is a lesbian fiction, 80s or 90s novel mm-hmm. that's very important. Um, so yeah. yeah, yeah, I was assuming that was the yeah the inspiration. Yeah, yeah. No, not so I, much I mean, I liked it. I wouldn't like like I said, I wouldn't shout it from the rooftops. I think it's good. Um, I'm glad I read it. I learned a lot. We'll have to wait and see how many uh, hijabs out of five it gets on, uh, <laughs> on the Insta. That's too obvious, Trevor. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would highly recommend this. I think it's a, a thoughtful, interesting book. And I think a lot of people would enjoy it. And not necessarily. Maybe you won't. But she's a good writer. And she's very thoughtful and intelligent. So worth listening to. With all that said, we'll move on to our next segment. Can you tell me a book I would also like? Anybody got a book that they would recommend to someone who liked this book? Yes. Yes. Um, So the book I'm recommending is um, called Julia Takes a Breath by Gabby Rivera. This is not a memoir. Um, It's a novel, but it also deals with a BIPOC woman struggling with her identity as a queer person. It's a lot lighter. Um, It has a lot more levity, a lot more fun than Hijab Butch Blues. But it's about the titular protagonist, Juliet, who um, comes out to her large Puerto Rican family immediately before leaving her home in the Bronx for an internship in Portland with a famous feminist writer. And while on the West Coast, she learns about what it means to be feminist and queer. And it's a very easy read. It's fun. It's charming. It has lots of heart. It goes in an unexpected direction, which I always appreciate in a novel. And it also features a sexy librarian who rides a motorcycle. So (laughs) how can you go wrong? As all librarians do. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's an accurate portrayal of all librarians. So that is Juliet Takes a Breath by Mm -hmm. Gabby Rivera. The, uh, the book I picked is another memoir by a woman called Ayan Hersey Ali. And she's actually written three books, uh, but I've only read the first one called Infidel. And so it's her story about growing up Muslim in uh, Africa, in Somalia particularly, but then also Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Kenya, and how she escapes that culture and moves to the Netherlands as a refugee and applies for political asylum there. And the difference with her from Lamna H is that she rejects Islam and is very critical of it. And you know how sometimes like politics makes strange bedfellows. So she kind of got into, or she was sort of treated like the poster child for some like uh, right wing anti-Muslim groups because of her experiences. But she ended up being elected to parliament in the Netherlands, but then her immigration status was in question because her uh, refugee forms were not filled in properly. So anyway, she had to resign from the parliament and actually renounce her Dutch citizenship. And that all happens in the first book. She now, I think, lives in the United States 
Her second book, uh, Nomad, I'm told, is uh, more about her childhood growing up in, in Africa. And the third book is more of a, a direct kind of like a critique of, of Islam. So it's an interesting read, uh, but it, it certainly has a different point of view than uh, uh, Hijab, Butch Blues. That's uh, Infidel by Ayan Hersey Ali. And we no longer have a print copy of it in the system, but I did find it on Libby. So it is available to borrow through our library. Mm -hmm. So I haven't read anything quite like this. And so I was just searching around for like read-alikes or books you might like if. And not, I haven't read any of them. So um, I settled on The Essential Dykes to Watch Out For by Alison Bechdel. Because we'd read one of Alison Bechdel's yeah. graphic novels previously. We read Fun Home a couple of years back. And that was a great read. Very enjoyable. So The Essential Dykes to Watch Out For is the lives, loves, and politics of cult fave characters Moe, Lois, Sidney, Sparrow, Ginger, Stewart, Clarice, and others. Bechdel has been making this strip, Dykes to Watch Out For, for 25 years, and this is a collection in award-winning volumes with a quarter million copies in print. Settled into this wittily illustrated soap opera, Bechdel calls it half op-ed column and half endless serialized Victorian novel, of the lives, loves, and politics of a cast of characters, most of them lesbian, living in a mid-sized American city that may or may not be Minneapolis. Her brilliantly imagined countercultural band of friends, academics, social workers, bookstore clerks, fall in and out of love, negotiate friendships, raise children, switch careers, and cope with aging parents. Bechdel fuses high and low culture, from foreign policy to domestic routine, hot sex to postmodern theory, in serial graphic narrative suitable for humanists of all persuasions. So yeah, I'm basing it entirely on having read Fun Home and thinking that uh, it would be interesting to read this as well. Hmm. So now for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which are, and I didn't come up with a clever catchphrase for this month. So I'm just going to leave it like that. <laughs> nerd Words for Word Nerds. Do you want to explain the concept, uh, Dennis? <laughs> Well, it's just we like words, oh, yeah. and we, we're going to talk about them because we're nerds who like, like words. words. We are nerds who like words. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who would like to start with their word? I mean, I could, I could go. Um, I had hinted that it was a uh, Arabian word, and it's ilm al kalam, or kalam for short. And what ilm al kalam is is the scholastic, speculative, or philosophical study of Islam. And uh, the shortened version, kalam, actually just translates into uh, the word word, as in kalam Allah, the word of God. And, uh, and I thought that in a kind of a radical way is what Lamnya H. was doing with this book. She was doing a speculative study of Islam. And another term that's maybe more common in terms of uh, Christian study is called apologetics, which is a word I always kind of got confused with because it often gets shortened to apologists, like Christian apologists, which I always thought meant people that were apologizing for Christianity. Like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry that this, you know, it's happening. But it just means somebody that is explaining it and writing about it. So, kalam. I thought that that was going to be the root word for calamity. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that would have been neat, but nope. I'm going to try to start. You know how, like, you know, young people will sometimes, like, uh, punctuate a sentence by saying word. I'm just saying, Kalam. I feel like word has been out of fashion for like two decades. Yeah, but <laughs> Kalam is, is ready to take uh, take take the spot. This is where we reveal again that we are middle aged, so <laughs> we're not hip with the latest things. I still think a breves is really recent, uh, but I feel like that's probably people in their twenties now, thirties. <laughs> Kalam. Kalam. Okay, my word is different from your word. Your kalam is different? <laughs> it sure is. Um, <laughs> my kalam is queer, which is, as it's understood in today's context, it's an umbrella term for people who are not heterosexual or not cisgender. But it has a storied past. It was first used in English in the 16th century to mean strange, odd, peculiar, or eccentric, or it could refer to something suspicious or not quite right. 
But by the late 19th century, the word was gaining a connotation of sexual deviance and was used as a pejorative term to refer to feminine men or men who are thought to have engaged in same-sex relationships. And in, during Oscar Wilde's trial in 1895, where he was convicted of gross indecency, a letter from the Marquis of Queensbury detailing his disgust at Wilde's relationship with his son was read aloud, and he refers to Wilde and other homosexual men as snob queers. So the word um, was in the mainstream by the 20th century, however, was still used in a negative way. But in the late 1980s, queer began to be reclaimed from its pejorative use as a neutral or positive self-identifier. But just like other words that have been reclaimed, there are still those who don't like it and don't use it because of its historical derogatory usage. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Nice. Kalam. <laughs> I just wanted to say it again. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I guess if you had a poetry slam, you refer change poetry to a word, it could be a clam slam. <laughs> I also want to say Shazam. I know. Yeah. Clam Shazam. Or clam chowder. <laughs> clam is a strong word. It's got the, you know, the K sound in it, the uh, yeah. L and M. It's, we might uh, be pronouncing it wrong, though. We might be. Yeah, yeah. We, might be. we should call up with that French guy. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, today we are learning how to pronounce the word. I'm surprised you haven't already. Right. I neglected to spell it. K A L A M. I suspected. Okay. Yeah. But, so, my word for this month is exegesis. Exegesis is a from the Greek, and I can't read the Greek alphabet that they used in on Wikipedia to describe it. So, uh, it means to lead out. It's a critical explanation or interpretation of a text. The term is traditionally applied to the interpretation of biblical works, but in modern usage, exegesis can involve critical interpretations of virtually any text, including not just religious texts, but also philosophy, literature, or virtually any other genre of writing. The phrase biblical exegesis can be used to distinguish studies of the Bible from other critical text explanations. And textual criticism investigates the history and origins of the text, but exegesis may include the study of the historical and cultural backgrounds of the author, text, and original audience. Other analysis include classifications of the type of literary genres presented in the text and analysis of grammatical and syntactical features of the text itself. Uh, And fun note, one who practices exegesis is called an exegete. (laughs) So I felt like this would be right up Lamia's alley, um, Mm -hmm. that she did a lot of that and is really into it. So yeah, exegesis. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For our next episode, we're going to read and discuss This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone. Among the ashes of a dying world, an agent of the Commandant finds a letter. It reads, Burn Before Reading. Thus begins an unlikely correspondence between two rival agents hell-bent on securing the best possible future for their warring factions. Now what began as a taunt, a battlefield boast, grows into something more. Something epic, something romantic, something that could change the past and the future. Except the discovery of their bond would mean death for each of them. There's still a war going on after all, and someone has to win that war. Have comments or book suggestions for us? Send us an email. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes there too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time Time to read. Read. In, in real time, the uh, library catalog. I think either that or he's responding to a text. <laughs> uh, no, I am searching for Ray Saint Germain yeah. in our catalog. This is high end entertainment. <laughs> no, we just have his book. Ah, uh, and you can't even borrow this book. No, <laughs> okay. History room. We have you know what? History room. It makes it more special.
if That's you could true. just have it sent out to your local library area, you wouldn't probably appreciate it the same as if you came, you took a bus downtown, found the local history room. Lord knows where it is. Well, you'd Fourth ask the floor, staff. third floor? Fourth floor. Fourth floor. <laughs> we know exactly where it is. Uh, it used to be on the third floor, right? Never was uh, on the third well, floor. Well, you don't it work was, here. It was many years ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't come down here that often. <laughs> you come here every month. <laughs> I do apologize to the staff of the uh, local history room who I do a, a great service to the community and beyond. Yeah. Okay. That's our only uh, check in. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to cut out like half of it. Yeah, your please. Room. Like I started. Yeah. Just, yeah. No. Okay. No, that's, that segment um, is just begging to be edited. Yes. Edited down to a tight three. Probably. Or two. Or two even. Look at that. Well, we'll see. We'll 90 see. seconds. The rest of it might be the, the rest of it might be the after. Yeah, you know, segment. you could just say, you know, no one had a check in this month, so we're just going to move right on, and then yeah. that's fine too. I'm fine with that because I really yeah. stumbled out of the starting gates with that one.